The program you're about to see is the story of the man some claim was the founder of Christianity. Not Jesus, but the Apostle Paul. In recent years, scholars have put forward a lot of new ideas about Paul. In the next hour or so, we'll hear from a number of them. Some of their conclusions are at odds with each other and at odds with how traditional Christianity has viewed Paul. But when we put Paul back into his first century context and listen carefully to his own words from within that culture, we arrive at a new and challenging view. What does this mean in practical terms for those who value Paul's teachings and those of Jesus of Nazareth? That's what we're about to find out. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Saul of Tarsus, better known as the Apostle Paul, a violent and arrogant persecutor of the early followers of Jesus, but his life took a dramatic turn following a startling encounter on the road to Damascus. Who was Paul? Some claim he was the founder of Christianity. If anyone could be labeled maybe as a Christian, you might think it's Paul until you back off a bit and look. We think of Paul as a Christian because we're standing on top of 20 centuries of the development of Christianity. The idea that, uh, that Paul uh, tried, came to start a new religion is, is uh, about as absurd as the idea is that Jesus came to start a new religion. The early Christian movement was clearly a Jewish movement. Jesus and Paul, Mary Magdalene, the beloved disciple, they're all Jews. Some scholars are introducing us to an unfamiliar Paul, a Jewish teacher who would be embarrassed by the popular notion that he gave up on his ancestral faith. It's a view that challenges traditional Christian ideas and engages us in a journey of discovery. A quest for the real Paul. With over one billion adherents worldwide, Christianity makes a claim on every sixth person on earth. Yet what most 21st century Christians believe and do differs greatly from what the early New Testament church taught and practiced. The Christian church today in almost any form is very, very different from the Christian church of the first century. It's no surprise then that both Jesus the Jew and Paul the Jew have been misinterpreted and misunderstood. How that happened and what it may mean for us today is the subject of this program. Hello, I'm David Hume. I'm glad you could join us today as we begin a journey of discovery, a quest to find new insights into the man we know as the Apostle Paul. As author of over half the books of the New Testament, Paul casts a long shadow over contemporary Christianity. Visitors to the Vatican encounter the Apostle as they file past this statue on their way into St. Peter's Basilica. Paul's massive influence is well expressed by Tadolini's giant sculpture. In one hand, Paul holds a sword, and in the other, a scroll with scriptural text. But it's strange that as familiar as Paul is to us, some scholars now insist that for centuries, many people have misunderstood what Paul the Jew taught about the law of God. They've claimed that for Paul, the law had no practical application in everyday life and that he attacked it vociferously. They've insisted that this Jewish apostle to the Gentiles did away with the need to keep the law. But how did these ideas come to be so widely accepted? We know from an early date that Paul's writings were regularly misunderstood. In fact, his fellow apostle Peter says that many in the first century struggled with Paul's writings often explaining them wrongly. In all of Paul's letters, there are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Peter said that many claim to understand the Hebrew scriptures, but that the opposite was true. They didn't understand and they even twisted their meaning. He said the same was true about Paul's writings. 
So how did Paul come to be so misrepresented? In the early days of Christian development, three prominent individuals had a long-lasting and profound impact. Marcion, the Catholic bishop, Constantine, the Roman emperor, and Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer. Marcion was thought to have been the son of a second century bishop in Pontus on the southern coast of the Black Sea. He was openly anti-Jewish and tried to rid the church of the Hebrew scriptures. He believed that the religion and the literature of the Jews was not something Christians should associate themselves with. His ideas were to do away with the connection between, between Christianity and Judaism and to indicate that the, the Old Testament was a uh, record of a failed religion and it should be destroyed and actually had been destroyed by Jesus himself. Marcion cast him as a man who did away with Jesus' teachings about keeping God's law. He put forward the idea that Paul was anti-Jewish and against the God of the Hebrew Scriptures. He took some of the uh, Pauline epistles and some of the book of Luke and he edited them very extensively to eliminate anything that had any connection seemingly with uh, Judaism or with the Old Testament. With the, the heretic Marcion, we can see bubbling up the kind of thing that Paul was aware might bubble up. Somebody who went right through the New Testament writings, excluding the bits which made it look as though Christianity really was the fulfillment of Judaism, and turning Christianity into a new sort of pagan religion. As a result of Marcion's teachings, church leaders had to excommunicate him and brand him a heretic. But even though he and his arguments were rejected, Marcion's anti-Jewish ideas have continued to reverberate within mainstream Christianity. Christians, without knowing it, I think, today, have distilled certain versions of the faith that end up sounding a lot like Marcion. And I think it's, uh, it's still a heresy today. It's probably best uh, characterized in the church today in the form of the antinomianism, the position against the law. Uh, that is very much a part of many, many Christian denominations today. Despite the fact that Marcion was thrown out of the Catholic Church, influential leaders and theologians carried his anti-Jewish and anti-law ideas forward. At the beginning of the fourth century, Constantine, the first Roman emperor who claimed to be Christian, enshrined anti-Jewish practices in the Catholic Church. Christianity under Constantine becomes a form of imperial Roman culture. One Christian denomination is favored with his patronage. Many have doubted Constantine's initial conversion to Christianity, since it was only on his deathbed that he verbalized his personal commitment. What he helped create was a very different religion. Here's the Roman emperor with all his pomp and pageantry, turning Christianity essentially into a sort of pagan mystery religion of sorts, I think Paul would have been nauseated by it. Constantine's influence no doubt pushed Judaism and Christianity away from one another or accelerated that process which I think was already underway even before Constantine's time. I think Paul would have been distressed by it. The type of Christianity that Constantine is patronizing is very different from the type of Christianity that Paul is enunciating more Christians are persecuted after the conversion of Constantine than before, precisely because they're targeted by, by um, one particular branch. Constantine did not allow Christians to celebrate Easter based on the date of the Passover as kept by the Jews. He declared such dating heretical, though it was thoroughly biblical. When uh, Constantine, almost by imperial edict, stated in one of his letters, let us therefore have nothing more in common with these pitiful Jews who are the murderers, murderers and parasites of our Lord. And therefore, this irregularity that was Passover observance had to be changed. Constantine's approach seeped into the preaching and writing of two of the most influential church fathers of the fourth century, John Chrysostom and Augustine of Hippo. Both men tried to mix Hebrew and Greek ways of thinking and at the same time perpetuated the emperor's anti-Jewish bias. This was a radical departure from the original understanding of the New Testament church. Christianity as we know it today has been a conscious effort that began in the second, third, 
and fourth centuries and continued on to the present time of attempt to blend uh, Hebraic thought with Neoplatonic philosophy and the two just simply don't mix. This philosophical blending began to produce theological concepts such as the Trinity, an idea that Paul never taught. If we think of Paul as an Orthodox Christian, we will only misinterpret him that much more. He's living in a period where he's not thinking in a Trinitarian manner. The idea of the Trinity hasn't been conceived yet. His letters will have Jesus Christ in them. They will have God, the God of Israel, God the Father in them. He will talk about the Spirit of God. And those are the textual origins that will be used to formulate the doctrine of the Trinity. But Paul's not thinking in a Trinitarian way. Coming forward to the time of the Protestant Reformation, we find that its most famous leader, Martin Luther, also added to the confusion about Paul's teachings. Luther did, for all sorts of interesting historical and personal reasons, polarize law and gospel in a way which I think does not do justice to the much more nuanced account that we find in Paul. Luther was opposed to the Catholic idea that performing good works could earn salvation. In so doing, he took Paul out of his Jewish context and used some of Paul's arguments to fight against the Catholic Church. Because Luther thought Paul was anti-Jewish, his misuse of Paul meant that over time, all things Jewish came to be viewed as degraded and degenerate, even by scholars. A great deal of Christian scholarship has begun from an anti-Jewish premise, in part influenced through Luther and in part influenced simply through stereotypes that have come down through the centuries. Luther's anti-Jewish views added fuel to the fire of anti-Semitism. What shall we Christians do with this rejected and condemned people, the Jews? First, to set fire to their synagogues or schools, and to bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn. Believing the end of the world was very near, Luther thought the Jews would convert to his form of Christianity. When by the end of his life they hadn't, Luther venomously denounced them from his deathbed, demanding that all Jews be expelled from Saxony. We must drive them out like mad dogs, so that we do not become partakers of their abominable blasphemy and all their other vices. His language was so inflammatory that the Lutheran Church apologized for his words, albeit 400 years later. By the 20th century, the misunderstanding over Luther's use of Paul's writings was firmly embedded and remains the view of many, despite the apology for his anti-Jewish outbursts. John Gager believes we've had the wrong image of Paul almost from the beginning. The dominant reigning view of Paul, beginning in his lifetime and coming down into the early part of the 21st century, is wrong completely from top to bottom. The idea that he was a Jewish man who overthrew his Jewish roots and taught that all things Jewish are to be discarded turns out to be remarkably inaccurate and illogical. Gager believes that Paul was a keeper of the law and that he taught Jewish believers in Jesus to do as they'd always done and yet to accept Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. It's clear that he expects Israel uh, to continue to observe the Torah, to live faithfully. And this is, of course, the central category for Paul. When it came to the non-Jews, however, Gager believes Paul was a man with a variable approach. He says that he taught the Gentiles not to worry about the law of Moses and only to accept Christ. Israel must live faithfully according to the Torah, just as Gentiles must live faithfully uh, according to the message uh, which Paul preaches about the figure of Jesus as their new redeemer. But some say these approaches to Paul just don't make sense. When they put the apostle back into his first century and Jewish context, they say it's illogical that he would have taught more than one version of the gospel message to the early church. And I think the evidence is that Gentiles generally conform to what would be seen as, by outsiders as a Judaic form of life. They're not meeting on Sunday, you know, worshiping in a church. They know nothing of Easter or Christmas or any of the uh, Christian calendar. They're going to be going to meetings on the Sabbath, the seventh-day Sabbath, uh, 
This would be consistent with Paul the Jew's practice as a follower of Jesus the Jew. Paul made his position clear in a letter to the mostly Gentile church at Corinth when he wrote, Imitate me, just as I imitate Christ. Paul did not misunderstand Jesus' message of the kingdom of God, a message that suggested that there was a way other than the Roman way of violence, a message that suggested that everyone, male, female, uh, slave free, even I think Jesus would take it as far as Jew, Gentile, should all worship the one God. The picture of a Jewish apostle who had one set of teachings for the Jews and another for everyone else, or who gave up on practices such as the Sabbath and Holy Day observance, is at odds with the biblical record and with logic. Celebration of the Jewish festivals and celebrating uh, celebration of the Sabbath was an ongoing given almost. There was no attempt again to break away from these uh, historical and biblical practices that the church uh, in its earliest days had obviously continued on because they just continued to be a part of the Jewish community. It's very interesting that Paul even uh, encourages, if not enjoins, the observance of Passover upon Gentile Christians in uh, the book of uh, Corinthians. Toward the end of his life, the apostle spent time imprisoned here in Rome, and it's almost certain that he died here. But his life and teaching before he came to Rome is intensely interesting. His practice and example is recorded in the book of Acts as he traveled, allows us to gain insight into the controversy that surrounds him. It's important that we go back to the original biblical accounts to discover the unfamiliar Paul. Amy Jill Levine admits that scholarly debates over Paul can get confusing. So what then is the person in the street to do? Well, the first sense that any, the first step that anybody should take is to read what Paul says before they read what any of us biblical scholars have to say. It's to the New Testament we now turn as we try to discover the real Paul. In a nearby church, Santa Maria del Popolo, there's a reminder of the dramatic change of heart Paul experienced as a young man. Ironically, this church is thought to be the original burial place of the Emperor Nero, now dedicated to Jesus' mother, Mary. In the Chirasi Chapel is this work from 1601 by Caravaggio. It's probably the most famous painting of what is known as Paul's conversion. Here we see him apparently stunned into surrender to Christ and bathed in bright light from heaven above. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. As is often the case with depictions of historical events, the artist creates his own vision of reality. Here, Paul, a Jewish Pharisee, is wearing a crimson-colored Roman tunic. Paul was a Roman citizen, but it's unlikely that he would have worn Roman clothing, and the horse dominating the scene is nowhere to be found in the biblical account. There's no evidence that Paul was on horseback. He and his companions would probably have walked the 150 miles from Jerusalem to Damascus. The account tells us that Paul was taken into Damascus where he remained blind for three days. He was baptized, he regained his sight, and became a follower of Jesus. But what was he doing on the road to Damascus in the first place? It's a story that begins in Jerusalem, just after the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth. The book of Acts describes the event when Saul witnessed the stoning of the first New Testament martyr, Stephen. Saul looked on the murder with favor. This event inflamed Saul to indulge in more persecution. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. 
Saul was extending his persecution far and wide to other members of the new sect. But then came his sudden and dramatic encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, and that changed everything. Saul began to see things literally through newly opened eyes. But does that mean Paul, as he now became known, had to renounce his faith? He was, after all, a Jew of the sect of the Pharisees. Did he suddenly become non-Jewish? The answer is clear from the scriptures. How did he describe himself in the early church? Like his traveling companion and biographer Luke, Paul sometimes referred to his new faith as simply the way. Even later in life, when Paul described what he'd done to the early church, he still used the same language. He said, I persecuted this way to the death. Nowhere does Paul speak of two ways, one for Jews and another for Gentiles. He certainly recognized that they came from Jewish and Gentile backgrounds. But as followers of the way, he emphasized that there was no difference between them. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul also spoke of these Jewish and Gentile followers of Jesus as simply the Church of God. Showing that he regarded them as a unified group, he said to those at Corinth that they should give no offense to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the Church of God. For Paul, there was one church, not two. Paul's experience on the road to Damascus led him to a complete turnaround in his attitude toward the followers of Jesus. He became part of that group of people who comprised the early New Testament Church of God. Their belief was a continuation of the way of life God had revealed in the Hebrew Scriptures, but which Judaism of the first century had failed to properly represent. Those Scriptures had also foretold the appearance of the Messiah, but Judaism as a whole had not recognized the Messiah in the person of Jesus. But does this mean that Paul was therefore a convert to a new religion? The old perspective on Paul is that he became a Christian and that that meant something other than being Jewish. It's captured very nicely in a children's Christian cartoon I once saw where Paul is going on the road to Damascus and he has the Jewish male head covering, the kippah, on his head. He gets knocked to his feet, the shining light is on him, Jesus speaks to him, and he, for the rest of the cartoon he doesn't have a kippah on anymore. Finished. He's Christian. Christianity is so easily imagined as somehow the opposite of Judaism because that's how Christianity has presented Judaism to itself in the centuries long after Paul. In Paul's lifetime, Christianity is only understandable as an extreme form of Judaism. And Paul himself thinks of himself as a Jew. Paul did not see himself as an apostate, as somebody who abandoned his Jewish faith. Far from it. In Christ, he has discovered it. He believes in Christ, Scripture is fulfilled. The promises of the prophets have come to pass. And so I think if you were to ask Paul in modern terms today, he would say, at last, I've become a true Jew because of Messiah Jesus. For Paul, this was what Judaism was really all about. And it wasn't a matter of uh, there was Judaism and we now see why it was wrong and here is something new. It's a matter of discovering what Judaism was really all about in the light of the fact that God had sent the Jewish Messiah at last and it turned out to be the Jesus who died on a cross. In modern terms, we tend to think of a convert as someone who's changed religion. But for Paul, conversion meant a deeper understanding and belief in his existing religion. This means he had more in common with Jesus and the Jews than ever he did with the early church fathers who invented a very different religion. Paul isn't converting from Judaism to something else. He's joining a Jewish group within Judaism. We know this from what he told the leaders of the Jews at Rome. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. This was Paul's approach as he began his ministry 
soon after his experience on the road to Damascus. In fact, he was soon in the synagogues there telling the Jews all about his experience. But does this mean that he abandoned his cultural and educational roots? This is what many have believed for centuries. And although Paul is spreading Jesus' gospel to Gentile churches, Paul consistently identified himself as a Jew, a Hebrew of Hebrews, of the tribe of Benjamin, according to the law of Pharisee. Paul never left that Jewish connection. In fact, he seems to boast in it. We can learn more about Paul the Jew by studying his education and background. We know from the book of Acts that he was born in Tarsus, a Greek-speaking city in Asia Minor. Tarsus had become the capital of the Roman province of Cilicia in 64 BC and a major city of the Eastern Roman Empire. Located on a fertile plain on the river Kidnus, it was about 10 miles from the sea. In Paul's time, the two trade routes to the east and south met about 50 miles away and continued on through the city. 20 miles to the north is a narrow gorge known as the Cilician Gates, the only pass through the Taurus mountain range, linking the Near East and the city of Ephesus on the Aegean Sea. Cleopatra, the Macedonian princess who became queen of Egypt, honeymooned in the city with Mark Antony. This ancient Roman gate is named for both Cleopatra and Paul. Under the Romans, Tarsus became a center for agriculture and the manufacture of fabric, much as it is today. By Paul's time, there was a university established here, practiced in the teaching of Greek philosophy. Its schools were said to rival those of Athens and Alexandria. But how did this play out in Paul's life? We know from the New Testament that he was a Roman by birth, that he was a skilled writer, practiced in Greek philosophy and fluent in Hebrew and Greek. Paul was also educated in Jerusalem at the feet of the well-known rabbi Gamaliel. So he was schooled in the religion and practice of the Jews to a very high degree. I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. And so from this exceptional background emerged an exceptional man. Paul would later write about his pedigree. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Concerning the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. The persecution of the church in Jerusalem had driven many believers back to their original homes in the cities and territories of the Roman Empire. Some had gone up the coast to Phoenicia, some to Cyprus, and some came here to Antioch where they established a new congregation. Soon they were joined by others, including non-Jews who were attracted to the way. The first century Jewish historian Josephus said that Antioch was third among the cities of the Roman world, after Rome itself and Alexandria. Antioch was a commercial center and the capital of Roman Syria. In Paul's time, its population was around 500,000. It's located on the Orontes River, and although 18 miles from the sea, it had its own seaport named Seleucia. There were important connections between this city and Jerusalem, the builder of Jerusalem in the first century BC, Herod the Great, had also paved and put colonnades along the main street of Antioch. Today, there are not many Jewish people left in Antioch, but in the first century, there was a very large community here. And generally in the synagogues outside of Judea, there were at least three groups of people to be found. A synagogue, community in the diaspora would have Jews and interested Gentiles as its group. Within the group of interested Gentiles, some Gentiles might be so interested that they might be right on the border of thinking of making a, an exclusive commitment to Judaism. Those are the people we call proselytes, which is just the Greek word for convert. Once those Gentiles become Jews, convert to Judaism, they, as Paul says in Galatians, they're obligated to live completely Jewishly, to keep the whole Torah, to keep the whole law.
And then there's this, this other group of interested pagan Gentiles who are God-fearers and do Jewish things with their Jewish friends. So Paul encountered at least three kinds of people in the synagogue. Diaspora Jews, whose first language was Greek, proselytes, Gentiles who'd adopted Judaism, God-fearers, pagan Gentiles who acknowledged the God of Israel, and we could also add other pagans who were curious Gentile onlookers. In Antioch, a large number of Gentiles had become converts to Judaism. To do so, they had undergone the essential ritual of circumcision. But God-fearers were not required to undergo circumcision. And a large number of people became followers of Jesus amongst the four groups in the synagogue. Antioch has long been famous in the Christian world. And Luke says that it was the first place that the followers of Jesus were called Christians. But this is not necessarily a compliment and not a term that they used of themselves. If you read the Greek carefully and literally, that it was in Antioch that the followers of the way were first called Christians. It doesn't say that they called themselves. And so it suggests the possibility that it was a term applied perhaps by Roman authorities to the followers of Jesus. There's definitely no, uh, no understanding of Paul's uh, perceiving himself to be a Christian within the uh, framework of how we perceive Christians or would define Christians in our time. Nowhere in the New Testament does Paul use the word Christian to describe the followers of Jesus or the early church. It's a surprise to learn that Christianity as we've come to know it didn't even exist in the first century. So what were these people, including Paul and the Gentiles amongst them, if they weren't Christians? Look, he's preaching the Hebrew God, Yahweh or Jehovah. He's telling the Gentiles about the Hebrew Bible, which it, it's translated into Greek, but essentially Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So instead of reading about Zeus and Apollo and the Pantheon, they're going to start telling Jewish stories. If you look at his letters, he refers to these stories as if they either know them or should know them. Our father Abraham, consider Isaac. Uh, he expects these so-called Gentiles or pagans to be very Judaized. According to the book of Acts, the early church referred to itself as the way. The Greek term is hodos, and we actually know that term from the word odometer. It's connected, I think, with the Jewish term halacha, the way we walk, the path that we follow. So Paul could not have considered himself a Christian as we understand the term today. He was simply a follower of Jesus, a follower of the way, a member of the Church of God. He had come to Antioch from Tarsus at the invitation of Barnabas. Soon the two of them were set apart by God for a special work, agreed to by the other leaders here. Their first destination was Salamis in Cyprus. The island of Cyprus was the home of Barnabas, and it's not surprising that it was the first place the men visited. Depending on the winds, it would have taken only a short time to sail the 135 miles or so from Seleucia to Salamis. Salamis was the capital of Cyprus during the Greek Empire. In Paul's time, it was the major commercial center. Today, it's in the Turkish inhabited part of the island. The city lies in ruins after the 7th century Arab invasions. When Paul and Bartimaeus came here, they spoke in several local synagogues, indicating there were a large number of Jews in the city. This was to become the pattern in Paul's teaching. He would go first to the synagogue, speak to the Jews, Gentile proselytes, and God-fearers amongst them. He would tell them that the Messiah had come and prove it from the Hebrew Scriptures. These, after all, were the people with whom he had a common background. If Paul's message had contradicted the Hebrew writings and traditional worship, it's not likely that anyone would have listened. Nothing more is recorded of this stay in Salamis, though we know that later Barnabas returned to Cyprus to visit the believers. Paul and his party made their next stop on the west coast at Paphos, the Roman administrative capital. 
It was to be a very significant visit, the beginning of Paul's interaction with the larger Greco-Roman world to the west. The ancient harbor of Paphos was the first port of call in Cyprus for Roman vessels traveling through the Mediterranean. Here, Paul came into contact with the Roman governor of Cyprus, the proconsul Sergius Paulus. It's a name that's been found on three inscriptions, three Roman inscriptions, one of which identifies a curator of the river Tiber in Rome, and it's dated about the time that Paul would have been here. Sergius Paulus was convinced by Paul's teaching and became a believer, especially when Paul showed his spiritual advisor, the Jewish magician by Jesus, to be a fraud. Sergius Paulus came from Antioch of Pisidia in Central Asia Minor, where his family owned large amounts of land. It was to this city that Barnabas and Paul were soon to travel. Did the proconsul suggest that the travelers go next to his home region to deliver their message to his family? After all, they could have given help and support and contacts in the Roman colony. It seems a good enough reason for Paul to have left here and gone to Perga on what is today the southern Turkish coast. From Perga, the two travelers made a difficult journey across the challenging Taurus Mountains before reaching the colony of Antioch of Pisidia. Antioch was about 3,600 feet above sea level. The city was founded in 301 BC, and for much of that time, Jews had lived there. It was an administrative center in the province of Galatia, and named a colony in 25 BC by the Emperor Augustus. By Paul's time, some of the inhabitants were descendants of Roman soldiers who'd retired there. So the community Paul visited was both Jewish and Gentile. The city was undergoing extensive building during his several stays there. Its magnificence was said by some to resemble that of Rome. When Paul and Barnabas arrived in Antioch, Luke tells us that they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. The leaders of the congregation asked the Jewish visitors to speak to the people. Paul addressed them as sons of the family of Abraham and the God-fearers amongst you. So here's a clear indication that he was speaking to two distinct groups of people in the synagogue, some of the same kinds of people that were in the church in Antioch in Syria. Synagogue communities in the diaspora where Paul goes in the first century would have consisted of, I think in many cases, uh, as many as 50% uh, Gentiles. Many in the Roman Empire were impressed with Judaism, which was regarded as a very old religion, perhaps even the primary religion. Many Romans adopted the Hebrew God, and Judaism was granted special religious freedoms in some parts of the empire, including freedom to worship on the Sabbath. So it would not have been so strange for Romans to be in the audience in the synagogues outside of Judea. Paul's speech in the synagogue was so effective that some Jews and God-fearers joined with him. The Gentiles asked that the same message be given to them the next Sabbath, when we're told that almost the whole city came together to hear the Word of God. If Paul were teaching against the law, would he have been able to convince Jews in the synagogue, who became followers of Jesus, not to keep the Sabbath? And why would the Gentiles have asked Paul to meet with them the next Sabbath if meeting on that day was not their regular custom? Further, would Paul have asked Jewish and Gentile believers to do different things? For example, would he have asked the Jews to meet on the Sabbath and the Gentiles to meet separately on Sunday? How could they ever have been united on that basis? How could the church ever have met together? The only logical conclusion is that he taught them both the same thing, to worship on the same day, the Sabbath. Remember that he refers to them in the singular as the Church of God, not two different groups with different beliefs and practices. From here, Paul and Barnabas went southeast about 90 miles to Iconium. Iconium in ancient Phrygia became part of Galatia in 25 BC. It was connected to Antioch by a Roman road known as the Via Sebasti. Paul visited Iconium more than once during his ministry. 
and he wrote a letter to the churches in the surrounding area of Galatia. Again, Paul and Barnabas went into the synagogue, and many Jews and Gentiles were convinced. But then the remaining Jews became upset and poisoned the minds of the Gentiles against the new believers. But in spite of this, Paul and Barnabas kept on teaching for quite some time. It was only when a violent plot against them was discovered that they fled for their lives. The next two cities on Paul and Barnabas' journey, Lystra and Derby, were connected by an unpaved road. Today, there's virtually nothing to be seen of these cities. Following their visit, Paul and Barnabas retraced their steps, strengthening the new believers and appointing elders to take care of the new churches. Arriving back at Perga, they soon boarded a ship bound for their home base at Antioch in Syria. Once back at Antioch, controversy began to grow. The matter of what Paul was teaching, especially to the Gentiles, now came to a head. It was to become a major discussion in the New Testament church, one that required a council decision and a visit to Jerusalem. What exactly was the issue? In the Syrian Antioch church, there were many different groups of people, but they were all united in their belief. Then some men came from Judea and upset their peace. They were likely believers, but followers of the sect of the Pharisees. Though they had no instructions to do so from Jerusalem, they demanded circumcision of followers of the way who were Gentiles. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas had not required circumcision of the people they'd taught, nor had the church at Antioch made any such demand. The argument could not be settled. So Paul and Barnabas were sent to confer with the apostles in Jerusalem to seek a decision. They were received positively when they reported how the church had developed among the Gentiles. But again, contention arose. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. These Pharisees were insisting that the Gentiles be circumcised so that their understanding of the law of Moses could be maintained. After much debate, the apostles and elders in Jerusalem decided that adult Gentiles did not have to be circumcised. This was a clarification of how the law of Moses would be applied to Gentiles entering the community of the church. What Paul had taught was upheld as correct. The Jerusalem church also decided that the Gentiles should abstain from things polluted by idols from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. What's often missed is that these four prohibitions came from the time of Moses and governed the entry of Gentiles into the nation of Israel. They were in that respect part of the Mosaic law. There is no indication in the book of Acts that the Gentiles should not keep the law. What had happened in respect of circumcision is that the law was simply clarified. When Paul returned to Antioch, there was joy that his teaching had been upheld. Soon he and a colleague named Silas set out on a second journey, revisiting many of the same cities that Paul had been to before and going to several new locations as well. One of the cities Paul and Silas came to was Philippi in Macedonia, what is today northern Greece. The city was founded in 360 BC by the father of Alexander the Great, Philip II. Once the Romans conquered Macedonia in 168 BC, they built the Ignatian Way, joining the Adriatic and Aegean Seas, and Philippi became a major trading and military center. Many veterans retired here, so its population was largely Roman. The language spoken was mainly Latin, and the city was in some respects a miniature Rome. Paul goes to Philippi. He goes out on the Sabbath day to a place where he thinks people will be gathering for prayer. It, you could call it culture, but it's Jewish culture. It's not pagan culture. They're meeting on the Jewish holy day. They're in some way addressing prayers to the Jewish God reading the Jewish scriptures, and yet they're Gentiles. We find this through Paul's letters, too. In passing, he can mention uh, 
Christ our Passover. He doesn't stop to explain, oh, by the way, there's this obscure Jewish festival. You probably have never heard of it. He assumes they've heard of it. Seeking out people to meet with on the Sabbath, Paul went outside of the city of Philippi to the riverside. This is the river Ganges, nearby Philippi. It seems that when there was not a synagogue in a city, it was not unusual for people to gather by the river. When Paul came here, he met with a group of women who met regularly on the Sabbath. Nothing unusual for Paul then to join them because he was a Sabbath keeper himself. It seems that a number of them were persuaded. Luke writes that certainly one of them was a worshipper of the God of Israel. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in fine purple cloth. She was already a God-fearer, and the Lord opened up her heart to respond. Lydia was a Gentile God-fearer, not a Jewess. She was also a seller of purple dye or purple cloth, something that the Romans used in the manufacture of clothing, which means she was very likely a woman of considerable social standing. Once she and her household heard Paul's message, they were baptized, became followers of Jesus, and members of the Church of God. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Paul obviously did judge her faithful, and he and his party stayed with her for a little while. Next, they went on to Thessalonica, capital of the province of Macedonia, about a hundred miles away. Thessalonica was made a free city by the Romans in 42 BC. It had good relations with Rome and was never a colony, having its own form of government. The emperor was held in highest esteem and the cult of emperor worship thrived in the city. It's apparent from the letters that Paul wrote to the church that eventually formed here we know those letters as First and Second Thessalonians, that he and Silas met with considerable success and they worked very hard. As usual, they went first to the synagogue. Now they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. Some Jews were persuaded by Paul's teaching as well as others described as devout Greeks including leading women, all of these people were part of the same synagogue. So the commonality here that we're seeing is that all of these people worship the same God. The new congregation that formed here under Paul's leadership was composed of Jews and Gentiles, proselytes and God-fearers. Those Jews who were not persuaded raised a riot in the marketplace bringing a wrongful accusation before the city's rulers. They said that Paul and Silas were troublemakers, teaching that Jesus, not Caesar, was king. As a result, the rulers required Paul and Silas to leave the city. That evening, they left the believers for Berea, about 50 miles to the southwest. Berea is in the foothills of the Olympic Mountains, a little off the beaten track, but an important town in Paul's time prosperous and with a Jewish population. This is part of the restored Jewish quarter with its synagogue. Here Paul came and he spoke with the Jews and he said he found them to be more fair-minded than the ones in Thessalonica. These people were willing to examine the scriptures daily to see whether what Paul said was true. Soon a congregation was founded and amongst them were also worshippers who were Gentile in origin, men and women of high-born status. In all of this, there's no indication that Paul taught anything against the Hebrew Scriptures. Before long, however, Paul's opponents arrived from Thessalonica and stirred up the people once again. So the new believers sent him on his way to Athens, where he would wait for his colleagues to arrive. It was to be a momentous visit the site of Paul's well-known exchange with the Athenian philosophers. When Paul arrived in Athens, and as he waited for his colleagues to arrive, he became more and more concerned at the idolatry he saw all around him. He was astonished by the number of temples, statues, altars, and objects of worship to the Greek gods and the Roman emperors. 
So many, in fact, that the Greek geographer Strabo wrote that Athens must be the chosen residence of the gods, indicating that there were more statues there than he could take the time to write about. For Paul, the commandment keeper and the follower of Jesus, idolatry was a sin, breaking one of the Ten Commandments. And here at the famous Acropolis, visitors can still see what's left of those times. Paul would have seen the Parthenon, and inside the 40-foot colossal gold and ivory statue of Athena Parthenos, the virgin Athena goddess of Athens. In Paul's time, Athens had declined in importance from its previous classical days of greatness. It was primarily an intellectual and cultural center. As usual, Paul went first to the synagogue and reasoned with the Jewish and Gentile worshipers. But he also spoke in the famous marketplace where the Greek philosophers met, down below the Acropolis. Here in the Forum or Marketplace, Paul came into contact with the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers who met for debate and discussion in the porches or stoa around the market area. This central area was also filled with statues and temples. When Paul told the crowd about Jesus and the resurrection, he received a mostly negative response. Some of the philosophers insulted him by calling him a babbler, a picker of scraps of religious or philosophical knowledge. Others were concerned enough about the introduction of new gods to challenge the Athenian religious order that they took him to the Areopagus, the official court of the government of Athens. And they brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. Paul's defense was masterful. He described how during his stay in Athens, he'd come upon an altar to the unknown God. Such altars did exist. The second century writer Pausanias mentions seeing them in Athens. So Paul could never have been accused of introducing a new God when he said that the unknown God was the very God he represented. Paul's main argument was that the worship of many idols is nothing to do with the one true God who created everything. That God is not found in temples made with human hands, such as those up on the Acropolis. Paul was telling them that idolatry is wrong, and because the world has sinned in many ways, this being just one of them, God will send a man to judge the world. The man he will send has already been resurrected from the dead. At the mention of the resurrection, some turned away from Paul's speech, but others believed him. Among them, a man named Dionysius, a leader of the Areopagus, and a woman called Damaris and several others. From here, Paul moved on 50 miles to the west, to the commercial capital of the area, Corinth, where he was to have much success. Classical Corinth was founded in 1000 BC and almost completely destroyed by the Romans in 146 BC. Nearly 100 years later, Julius Caesar rebuilt the city as a Roman colony. By the 50s AD, it was fast becoming the wealthiest city in southern Greece. From this vantage point on the Acro Corinth, almost 1900 feet above the Peloponnesian Peninsula, it's easy to see why in Paul's time, the city was so important from an administrative and commercial viewpoint. Like most cities with port facilities, Corinth fostered a mobile and decadent society, but its everyday moral problems were only made worse by local religious practices. The geographer Strabo claimed that in the first century BC, 1,000 female slave prostitutes who've been dedicated as offerings, were active at the Temple of Aphrodite. It's known that the temple, which was associated with immorality, was restored in Roman times. In any case, the prostitutes brought much wealth to the area and probably worked in the city down below. In this challenging and corrupt environment, Paul stayed for 18 months and established a group of followers of the way. This inscription on white marble was found on the Lechian Road near Corinth's Forum. In its entirety, it probably read, Synagogue of the Hebrews. Archaeologists speculate that it was placed over the door of a synagogue built a little before or after Paul's visit 
it demonstrates that there were enough Jews in Corinth to warrant such a building. The New Testament confirms this at the time of Paul. Luke tells us that Paul went to the synagogue every Sabbath in Corinth and spoke with the Jews and the Gentiles, the proselytes and God-fearers. Eventually, the Jews would no longer listen, so Paul went solely to the Gentiles in this city. Two of them became members of the church, one named Justus, who lived by the synagogue, and another, the synagogue ruler, Crispus. Once he joined, other Corinthians joined with him. But soon, opposition from the Jews boiled over. Perhaps one of the reasons was that Crispus, whose title, ruler of the synagogue, could mean public benefactor of the synagogue, had become a follower of the way. Thus, the Jews had lost a God-fearing financial supporter. So they brought Paul before the Roman proconsul Gallio and accused him of teaching people to worship God against the law, in effect, of promoting an illegal religion. It was an illogical argument. Paul, as a Jew, as a Pharisee, uh, as he describes himself, uh, deeply believed that his gospel was was embedded in the Torah. Uh, and, and his argument, both with Gentiles and presumably with Jews with whom he argued, was that this is not my own invention. I have received it in a revelation from God. And if you understand the Torah properly, you'll see it there too. Judaism was a legally recognized religion in the Roman Empire. Gallio saw the case against Paul as an internal Jewish matter and threw it out effectively recognizing the followers of Jesus as a legal part of Judaism. This allowed the church in Corinth to flourish. So what did Paul teach the members here in Corinth? Did he do as he'd done in other places? His two extant letters to the church here tell us all about it. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Here in a brief passage, we see that Paul was willing to follow Jesus, his master, exactly in doing what he did on his final Passover evening with his disciples. And this is something that was written 20 years after Paul's experience on the Damascus Road. But did Paul recommend that followers follow Jesus in other ways? For example, did he expect them to keep the Sabbath and the holy days just as the Jews of that time did and as Jesus himself had done? We find in a passage in Corinthians where Paul writes to Jews and Gentiles that he expects them to keep a feast that the ancient Israelites had kept. Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. When he speaks of keeping or observing the feast, he's speaking of the feast of Passover and the days of unleavened bread, something that Jesus himself kept. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. Even in the Gentile world, Paul was following Jesus' example down to the letter in observing the holy days that God had commanded of ancient Israel in the Old Testament. Paul traveled next to the city of Ephesus, then a major port on the other side of the Aegean Sea. To do so, he came here to Cancrea, Corinth's eastern port. People traveling to Jerusalem from Greece could easily have used Ephesus as a resting place. It was the capital of the Roman province of Asia and home to the most beautiful structure on earth of its time, the Temple of Artemis. Known to the Romans as Diana, she was the Greek goddess of hunting and fertility, and most of the inhabitants of Ephesus worshipped her. 
Paul lived and taught here for up to three years. The New Testament shows that his approach was consistent with the pattern he'd established in cities previously visited. When Paul first came here, he went as usual to the local synagogue. But he didn't stay long because he wanted to be in Jerusalem as soon as possible. He said, I must by all means keep this coming feast. The feast or festival that he refers to is the biblically commanded Feast of Pentecost, which occurs in May or June. So this again gives a clue to Paul's own personal practice and surely what he would have taught Gentile believers. Luke also refers to holy days as calendar markers on their journeys. Clearly, both of them thought of keeping the holy days as they planned their travels. When Paul returned here, he came overland from Jerusalem and Antioch, and he began where he left off, teaching in the local synagogue, which he did for about three months. It was only when people there rejected what he had to say and spoke critically of the way that he started teaching daily in a local philosopher's school where he met with much success. This continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Though most of the Jewish community rejected Paul's message, some did believe. But he had his greatest success amongst the God-fearing non-Jewish population of the city and the surrounding area. It may be that during Paul's time, Ephesus and Asia in general saw more growth than any other. From here, Paul went on to Macedonia and Greece, where he continued teaching and encouraging the believers there for another three months. On his return from Greece a little bit later, Paul again stayed here in Philippi. Luke tells us that they departed Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, which are associated with the Jewish Passover season. He also tells us that Paul was anxious to get back to Jerusalem in order to keep the Feast of Pentecost. So here we have a couple of examples of Paul and his colleagues, Jews and Gentiles alike, keeping the Jewish holy days. According to Ben Witherington in his commentary on the book of Acts, Paul kept here in Philippi either the Jewish Passover or a Christianized version of it. John Gar takes the argument a little bit further. Well, I think that he would have been keeping the Passover, first of all, with those who were a part of his own Jewish community his own Jewish family, but that he would also have been observing the Passover with those in, uh, who were believers in Jesus from the Gentile world, who were, as Paul said, in times past Gentiles, but now had become a part of the commonwealth of Israel. I think Paul's thinking was that these people who were in times past pagans, who were, which the Gentile term Gentile came to uh, connote, uh, had become a part of the commonwealth of Israel by being adopted into that family through their faith in, in Jesus as the Messiah. After Paul left Philippi on his way to Jerusalem by sea, he avoided a stop at Ephesus. Perhaps he feared he would be delayed by enemies. Instead, he sailed a little further south to the port of Miletus. Paul called for the Ephesian elders to come and meet him here in Miletus. He felt that it would be the last time they'd have an opportunity to get together. And so he spent time urging them to follow his example and to live the new way of life according to God's spiritual law. He no doubt told them why he was going to Jerusalem in such a hurry, to keep an annual holy day. Something they knew that was his practice and something he doubtless encouraged them to continue to practice after his departure. From this point forward, Paul's life is the story of the continuing expansion of his ministry in the places we visited and the continuing intrigue against him by the Jews and others. This opposition led to two periods of imprisonment for him and his eventual death in Rome. It's there that we now return in conclusion. It's thought that the apostle died here in Rome in the 60s AD during the reign of the Emperor Nero. Nero was out of town and it's said that someone beheaded Paul on Nero's orders. And this may be the prison where he was kept before that happened. Above you can see the sign that tells us this is the prison of the apostles Peter and Paul. And while there's no direct evidence that Peter was ever in Rome, there's certainly biblical evidence that Paul was. And there are other sites here in Rome that claim a connection with the apostle. It's said that Paul was buried in Rome 
at what is now called San Paolo Fuori le Mura, the Church of St. Paul outside the walls. The building stands where a previous church was constructed in the time of the Emperor Constantine. Evidence was found that associated the first church with Paul. There was an inscription on a slab of marble that read, Paolo Apostolo Martiri, the martyr, the Apostle Paul. In recent excavations, archaeologists believe they've confirmed that Paul's remains were placed there. Tradition has it that a Roman matron, Lucina, had Paul buried in her vineyard. Of course, apart from the biblical references to his impending death, this is hearsay and legend. As we've seen, what we can know of Paul, his life and times, and his journeys across many parts of the Roman Empire comes from the New Testament, not from tradition. As we've discovered on our journey today, the image that most people have of the Apostle Paul is really quite distorted. And not all of the scholars we've talked to would agree with the main conclusions we've reached. When asked what we should do as a result of the Jewish heritage that's been uncovered, some would probably say very little. I find increasing numbers of Christians today who want to recover the Jewish roots of Christianity. And I think that's splendid, but there's a way to do it and a way not to do it. I don't think it's appropriate for Christians to be celebrating those Jewish festivals. Why? Because Christianity as we know it today is primarily a Gentile phenomenon. Jesus the Jew does not offer Jewish practices to Christians. Christians were never expected from the Gentile world to adhere to Jewish practices and Jewish laws. James Tabor would not agree that Paul taught his listeners, whether Gentile or Jew, to avoid the teaching and practices of Jesus the Jew. I think these followers of Paul are essentially following the rhythms of Jewish life, is how I'd put it. They're very familiar with the calendar, with the holy days, and clearly deriving some sort of meaning out of these days. And as Professor Tabor points out, the historical record clearly demonstrates that these Jewish patterns continued among many people well into the fourth century in Antioch. This is the time of Chrysostom, the great Christian preacher. Uh, he's very anti-Jewish. He's very proud that Christianity has become the replacement of Judaism. But in half of his sermons, he's telling people, don't go to the synagogue. I don't want any of you going to the synagogue anymore. Quit keeping the Sabbath. Don't listen to your Jewish neighbors about what you should eat. And so it's very clear that even that would be in the fourth century in a major city, Christians that would call themselves Christians are still having this uh, exchange with Jews and being interested in Jewish things. But does that mean we should change our approach today? Tom Wright thinks that it's too simplistic to say that we should reject modern church practices and go back to what the early New Testament followers of the way did. He believes that the church has rightly moved beyond the beliefs and practices of the first century followers of Jesus in many ways. It's obvious if you go three or four hundred years down the track that the later church developed in all sorts of ways which the earliest Christians uh, would never have imagined. Um, you know, all the kind of paraphernalia that we associate with the high imperial period of the fourth and fifth centuries and so on. Um, but in fact, when you look at the evidence, things are much more complicated as usual than a simple either or would make out. Yet other scholars like John Garr would say that we must return to the beliefs and practices of those early days if we're to come into line with the original teachings of Jesus and Paul. I think we have to go back first of all and get a new appreciation for the Bible of Jesus and the Apostles because this is, this is foundational to our faith and realize once and for all that the faith of Jesus and of the Apostles was a Hebraic faith that it was solidly rooted in the Hebrew Scriptures and then begin to sort out what we're doing in Christianity and what we believe in Christianity that is founded on the book. After studying and teaching about Paul for over 30 years, my own conclusion is that he taught a consistent message. Paul was not divided in his mind as to the beliefs and practices he taught. 
that means it would have been illogical for him to teach his audiences two different messages. Paul was not the founder of Christianity, as some have said. As a Jew, intent on following his master, Jesus of Nazareth, he taught both Jews and Gentiles to live the same way. They kept the seventh day Sabbath, observed the biblical holy days, and knew nothing of Easter or Christmas or the Trinity. After all the centuries of Christian development, it comes as a shock to many to discover that the original church was so very different. As one writer said, following the end of the first century, it's as if a curtain falls on the New Testament church for several decades. When that curtain rises, an entirely different church with different practices is in place. This explains why the perspective we've explored in this program has not really been heard before, and it's one that demands our attention. If you'd like to know more, please go to our website at www.vision.org. Thank you for joining us today. I'm David Hume.